Hi everyone, I'm Sandra and today on Mad Mugger, we're covering the first part of the Integration Techniques Crash Course. In this video, I'll cover some basics, integration by parts and integration by substitution. In the next video, I will talk more about a general approach to solving integrals of the form px over qx and anything that contains a trigger function. First up, basics. I'm going to assume that you already know how to integrate stuff like x to the power of n, 1 over x, e to the power of x, cosine x, sine x. Now you need to extend these into more general forms, meaning you can replace the x with fx on both sides and multiply by f prime x on the left hand side. And you can do the same with everything in MF26. Multiply the left hand side by f prime x and replace the x with fx on both sides. Why can you do this? How do you do this? And when do you do this? When you differentiate ln x, you get 1 over x. Conversely, if you integrate 1 over x, you get ln x. So if you replace the x with fx, to differentiate ln of fx using chain room, the outer layer, first you get 1 over fx, then the inner layer, you multiply by f prime x. Therefore, conversely, if you integrate f prime x over fx, you get ln of fx. The same chain rule logic can be applied to all the integrals in MF26 as well as the basic ones I mentioned earlier. Of course, you can definitely solve exam questions without understanding a single thing I just explained on this slide and just apply the result, but I just thought that having even a vague understanding might help you to remember better. It's more important to know how to apply these results. I'll start by comparing it to a simple example. Integrating x to the power of n, you get x to the power of n plus 1 over n plus 1. So, when n equals 2, when you integrate x squared, you get x cubed over 3 because n plus 1 is 3. Extend this result by replacing the x with fx and adding an f prime x here. Let's apply this to an example question. Integrating x times x squared plus 1 to the power of 2. In this case, fx equals x squared plus 1 and n equals 2. So when you differentiate fx, you get f prime x equals 2x. And since n equals 2, n plus 1 equals 3. Since you want the equation to be in the form f prime x times fx to the power of n, you need to pull out the f prime x like this. And then, after that, you can just apply the result already. So half times fx to the power of n plus 1 over n plus 1. And simplifying, you get the answer. A common rookie mistake is to think, okay, fx equals x squared plus 1 squared. Then when you try and find f prime x, it's going to be a huge mess and you'll be really confused. Which is wrong. Remember that the fx is the thing inside the bracket here, not the entire thing including the power. When do you do this? If you have an expression containing two polynomials where the difference in their powers is 1, for example, here's an x squared with an x cubed, here's an x with an x squared, you can pull out an fx and f prime x somewhere because differentiating a polynomial reduces its power by 1. For the first expression, taking fx equals x cubed plus 3x, that makes f prime x equals 3x squared plus 3. So you can see that this expression is in the form f prime x over fx. For the second one, if you take fx equals x squared minus 4, that makes f prime x equals 2x. So this expression is in the form f prime x times fx to the power of n, where n equals negative half. Take note that the n can be negative. Also, fx and f prime x may not always be the same type of function. For this question, fx equals to ln x and f prime x equals to 1 over x. So, the expression is in the form f prime x e to the power of fx. I'll talk more about the different possible variations in the next video when I'm discussing trigger functions and expressions of the form px over qx. Now let's talk about integration by parts. In integration by parts, knowing how to use this formula is just the first step. What really takes a bit more work is figuring out which is the u and which is the dv dx. I'll still start by explaining how to use the formula, but if you're already familiar with that, you can skip to the next section where I try to explain some of the thinking behind the choice of u and dv dx. You need to drill this into your head. Now let's look at how to apply this formula to a simple example, integrating x e to the power of x. You choose a u and dv dx from the expression, then work out the du dx and the v. I'm choosing u equals x and dv dx equals e to the x. So du dx equals 1 and v equals e to the x. On a side note, even though you don't actually need to write out this working on the side, 
I personally prefer to write down the full thought process every time to avoid making careless mistakes. Some people feel smarter when they skip steps and produce the final answer in fewer steps of working, but I don't advocate for that because you might lose method marks or make careless mistakes. Back to the question, we have u v minus v du dx, which is 1, so I won't write it in. And you can then integrate this directly to produce the final answer in the next line. For questions where you still can't integrate this directly, just apply integration by parts again and again until you can. So, how do you choose the u and dv dx? And for that matter, when do you use integration by parts? Generally, you choose whatever is easier to integrate as the dv dx and whatever is harder to integrate as u. If there's a ln or inverse trigo function somewhere, it's probably going to be your first choice of u because you can't integrate it directly. So for this, you would choose u equals sine inverse x and dv dx equals x square. For this, you would choose u equals ln x and dv dx equals x. In fact, even if you have an inverse trigo or ln function on its own, you can use integration by parts with dv dx equals 1. So to integrate cosine inverse x, you will use u equals cosine inverse x and dv dx equals 1. And to integrate ln x, you will use u equals ln x and dv dx equals 1. If there's no ln or inverse trigger function anywhere, your second choice would probably be x to the power of n. To get a sense of why, I'll run through an example integrating x squared sine x. So if I choose u equals x squared, du dx equals 2x and dv dx equals sine x, v equals negative cosine x. So u v minus v du dx. Notice that previously it was x to the power of 2, now you have an x to the power of 1 here. Then we continue again, choosing u equals 2x, du dx equals 2, and dv dx equals cosine x, v equals sine x. So applying integration by parts again, you now have u v minus v du dx. And again, the power has reduced by 1. Because every time you differentiate x to the power of n, it, the power goes up by 1, that's why it went from x squared to 2x and now to a constant 2. Whereas the trigger part just flipped between sine x and cosine x until the x to the power of n was gone and it could be integrated directly to get the final answer. So for something like x e to the power of x, you will also choose u equals x and dv dx equals e to the power of x because e to the x is very easy to integrate. It just it's just multiplied by a constant every time while you wait for the x part to be reduced to a constant. Then for something like this, you can choose u equals x and dv dx equals square root of x plus 1, in which case du dx equals 1, and the dv dx here is in the form f prime x times fx to the power of n. So it becomes fx to the power of n plus 1 over n plus 1. But if you have none of these, then perhaps your last choice might be e to the power of x or cosine or sine x because these are very easy to work with. And if you get them together, something like this, it honestly doesn't matter which one you choose as the u and the dv dx, just be consistent. So if in your first line of working you chose u equals e to the power of x, then subsequently every time you do integration by parts again, please still choose u equals e to the power of x. Because sometimes if you're not consistent, you end up with something like 0 equals 0. Now let's talk about integration by substitution. In H2 math, the substitution will always be given, and if they tell you to use substitution, you have to use it, even if there's another way to solve the question, as is the case here. Since the given substitution is x equals tangent theta, you're going to change this from something dx to something d theta, which means that you're going to need a dx d theta here. Because these two sort of cancel out such that these two expressions are still equal. You can work out dx d theta on the side. In this case, since x equals tangent theta, dx d theta is secant squared theta. For definite integrals, don't forget to work out the new limits as well. So here, when x equals 0, tangent theta is 0, so theta is 0. And when x equals 1, tangent theta is 1, so theta is pi over 4. And you can just write it here like this. Next, apply the substitution directly. 1 over x squared plus 1 is 1 over tangent squared theta plus 1. Using the trigger identity, tangent squared theta plus 1 is secant squared theta. Sub in the value of dx d theta, you are integrating 1 with respect to theta, which gives theta, and easily you find the final answer 
pi over 4. In this video, we've covered basic integrals and variations, integration by parts, and integration by substitution. Check out our next video for the second part of the integration techniques crash course. All the best for your school exams or A-levels or just life in general. Feel free to leave any questions or suggestions in the comments.